Chris. Mm. Hey, Chris. Let's go to the zoo. Mm -mm. Wait, how did you even get in my house? Welcome back, DP Review TV viewers. Chris Nichols here for DP Review. And we are coming to you today from the Calgary Zoo. We're gonna look at the Fuji X-H1 today. And you know, the reason we're at the zoo is that, you know, the X-H1 is really getting touted as this newfangled video camera from Fuji, but it's really so much more than that. And this is a large DSLR-like body. It denotes balancing with long lenses. And so I thought I'd shoot some wildlife today, but since we gotta deliver one of these one episode a week, and we don't wanna sit out in the woods for three days waiting for animals, why not come to the zoo? There's a lot of stuff here to play with. I think we're gonna have a good time. Now when you pick up the Fuji X-H1, the first thing you're gonna notice is just the difference in the body size and look. Aesthetically, it follows the GFX's lines and it has the display on top to show battery life, photos remaining, that always remains on. It's quite an interesting feature. On top of that though, it's a much larger grip. And again, for me personally, I like smaller grip cameras, but you know, Fuji actually said that one of the biggest requests they had from users was, get us a camera with a bigger grip. Now I've got the battery grip on here as well, the vertical battery grip, and I'm using the 100 to 400 XF lens today. And so what that gives us is a very SLR-like, very large professional looking body. And I think that's the way to go here. You know, with Fuji, you now have the choice of going X-Pro2, X-T2, you know, to a lesser extent, X-T3 and X-T20. I mean, you really get a lot of different body choices. Now the X-H1 is great for users who might want a more SLR type body. That being said, this body design is gonna polarize a lot of people. I mean, if you're a Fuji user and you want a bigger body to shoot longer lenses, I think this is gonna work out very well. But if you're somebody looking to move to mirrorless, you want something compact for travel, this is not a good choice. And if you're an existing SLR user and you're happy with the weight and size, moving over this might not make very much sense. Although I do have to say, it is definitely lighter than your standard SLRs. Okay, so you saw my first photo. You get the fence in there, so I'm using the tilty screen. Oh, this doesn't hurt at all. I'm sure those are rock solid. So there's three big advantages I like about the larger body. You know, first off, it is balancing this 100 to 400 well, and it's very weather sealed. Fuji's best to date, rugged body design, great for wildlife shooting. On top of that, we get the new 3.69 million dot EVF with 0.75 magnification. It is one of the nicest EVFs I've ever had up to my eye. Very similar to the Panasonic G9, which is my favorite to date. And on top of that, we've got a larger body because this is now housing an inbuilt in-body stabilization. And so I'm gonna talk about that quite a bit in depth. Now, if you know me, you know that I'm not a big fan of vertical grips because I just don't really like the extra bulk and weight, you know, trying to get it into a camera bag and stuff makes it tough. But I'm using it here on the X-H1 because it's critically important. Battery life is not great here. I mean, with NP126S's, the new ones, you're looking at 310 shots separated. That's not very high. So the grip lets me put two extra batteries in here. You know, the dark cloud over here does have a silver lining. I mean, the fact is, I do love that we have the display of all three batteries. It shows how they drain. I can charge the batteries through the grip with the supplied AC adapter. I can also charge the camera with USB charging. That unlocks a whole bunch of external battery sources and the like. And Fuji also gives you an external charger in there. So it's not all bad. It is something you're gonna have to face. Make sure you get extra batteries. Now, before we leave the fish here, I just wanna mention one thing here. It's very dark, as you guys can see, and I'm trying to focus on the fish, admittedly a very difficult situation. Now, the X-H1's been improved. It should focus to minus one EV. In here, it's having a hard time. I'm going to single point using the hybrid phase and contrast attack, sometimes zone. There's a lot moving on. In the end, I'm getting about 50% of my shots in focus, so it's doable, but it's not perfect. <laughs> What's the matter, are you tired? Yeah, like I know it's not heavy, but it's still heavy for a mirrorless camera, man. Dude, it's a 100 to 400, a camera, a battery grip, and three batteries. Is it a little heavy? Yeah, it's heavy, Jordan. You want me to go get a D500 and a 2 to 500? No, I'll, I'll behave. I'll be good. All right, 1.1 seconds. There you go. Yeah, see who needs a tripod. 
People who want to get sharp pictures need tripods, that's who. Okay, but it does point out some interesting features here that I'm playing with. Now, first off, we've got a classic vertical tilting screen, but you can flip it out like this. It's actually easier to use than the X-T2. I don't know why, because I never really loved that system. The other thing is the touchscreen autofocus. Now, it's there, it is laggy, I gotta be honest with you. It doesn't inspire confidence, you're always behind it. You know, if I touch in different areas, I'm not quite sure if it's gonna pick up, but it is there, you can use it while you bring it up to your eye, but again, it's a little bit slow. I think I'm gonna stick with the awesome joystick selector right here on the back. Now, the little girl I'm taking pictures of is not just some random kid at the zoo, that's my daughter Maddie, and I brought her along to take some shots. And I tested out some of the eye autofocus features on the X-H1. I, you know, it was okay, it works well. You can compose off-center and know the camera's gonna focus right on the eye, but it only works in single autofocus, so it won't track somebody moving forward or backwards for distance. And honestly, I found I would just go single point tracking, put it on her face, and then recompose, and that usually worked just as well. But it is a nice feature, but it's not as good as the Sony's. Okay, so I wanna take this opportunity to just touch on the shutter button here and I don't mean that as a joke I'm sorry I don't mean literally but the shutter buttons stirred up a lot of controversy and a lot of people dislike it in fact check out the XH1 review at dpreview.com but a lot of the DP review staff also found that they found it spongy and light didn't really like it now Fuji have built this on a leaf spring and I guess I'm gonna go on my own and say that I don't hate it. Uh, I, I don't find it that bad. You never really know when you're half pressing and you don't know when the camera's gonna take a picture. So it kind of surprises you, but I like that from a stability standpoint. And I'm finding that I'm getting used to it. It's not as problematic as I thought it would be or was expecting it to be. That being said, you can send it into Fuji, I've been told by them uh, at Fuji, that you can send it in and they can actually adjust it to three different strength levels. Now. That sounds like, like an arduous process, you know, send the camera in, get it back, oh, it's still not where I like it, try again, but that's what they say you can do. I'm finding it's fine just as it is. Now, if you're in Calgary, you happen to be around the zoo, the new exhibit, Panda Passages, here, we're very proud of it. It's not quite open yet, so we can't shoot them today, but by the time the video comes out, you can go check them out for yourself. Let's see if it's gonna pick up. Come on, there we go. So we're in the Calgary Zoo's Butterfly Conservatory, perfect place to test some of the features. Now first off, I'm using a very tiny single point autofocus, putting it right where I want, but like any close up, sometimes it's a little bit off. And that's what brings me to one of the real standout features as I use this camera more. It is this new generation viewfinder, just doing such a good job. They give you the resolution to make sure that you can focus accurately. Now manual focusing on this new 80 mil lens, the macro that I haven't tried yet, it's okay. It's by wire, so it's hard to really pinpoint it in, but I can just move my head in and out and very clearly see with the resolutions viewfinder when I'm in the target zone so big benefit I always thought the Fuji X-T2 viewfinder was amazing but this blows it away and if you're a DSLR user who's really used to those high-end optical viewfinders I think you'd find this very very adequate All right, so let's talk about autofocus on the X-H1 because in a lot of ways it's the same as what we've had before and there are some noticeable differences. First off thing I'm gonna say right off the bat, I am a back button focuser and I do love that we've got an AF on button there. I honestly don't use exposure lock that much so I would have customized that anyways. And despite the buttons being really close together, I haven't hit the wrong one yet, so that's a good sign. But in a lot of ways the X-H1 has a very similar focusing system to the X-T2 for example. It's that same very centralized phase detect autofocusing system. You can't expand that beyond that in any way because of course it's mechanically hardwired. And on top of that, although it does have a different processing system for autofocus, hence maybe the better low light performance gains and ability to focus at f11, it still operates in a very, very similar way. But there are some challenges I'm facing. You know, we've said this on the X-T2 as well, you gotta customize the right focusing mode for the right situation. But the challenge is how do I switch those quickly? You can customize some user settings so that it remembers those and quickly switch that way. Or you could stick them in my menu and try to change them quickly that way too. But it does take your eye off of the action and out of the shooting. And so I'm finding that, yeah, 
setting those up properly. If you use the wrong mode, I'm just not getting as much success as I'd like to. But don't take my word for it. Go to deepyearview.com. They did some extensive testing. You can see Dan Bercalli on his bike, and this shows you a good example of how you gotta keep things central for the phase detect autofocus to really kick in, and you gotta really customize the modes. I'm going full backpack. I'm, both arms. Uh, both, arm, both arms. Oh, red pandas. The finest of the pandas, other than the fact that we've got a new panda exhibit here at the Calgary Zoo, so come see the Calgary Zoo pandas. You don't have to choose, you can see both. We got a red panda photo. Oh, what a terrible photo. So sometimes you need really effective image stabilization and the X-H1's bigger body now supports built-in sensor-based stabilizers. This should help photographers and videographers. You know, the interesting thing though about it is it does work in conjunction with lenses that have image stabilization, but we're actually finding that fixed prime lenses without lens-based stabilization actually in some cases perform better. Go to dpreview.com and you can see this chart. It really shows you the amount of stops you'll approximately get in benefit. We're finding that certain zooms like like the 1855, 1024, and 55 to 200 don't perform as well. But interesting, you pick up some lenses, get that stabilization, and so far today it's working great. Chris, you're going to talk about continuous shooting. Oh, I don't want to. Jordan is boring. It's the same as the XT2. Eight frames per second mechanical. Eleven frames per second if you put the battery grip on in boost mode. Last lag time in between the shots. Minimal blackout time with the boost mode. Fourteen frames per second electronic. Yeah, go to Deep Review to come. Perfect. Land of lemurs, okay, so AFC custom setting set four for suddenly appearing subjects. I think that'll work well. All right, so I may have dramatically overestimated how quick these guys are moving and what kind of focusing control I would need, but that's okay. This lets us illustrate another topic here. So you can see the lemurs there sitting in the shade, but I'm taking pictures where we still get the white ear tips and the grass in front that's sunlit. And so what I'm gonna do here, because this has the same sensor as the X-T2, 24 megapixel X-Trans 3 sensor, it's very good in low light, and it's basically what we call an ISO invariant sensor, so I can really bring up shadow detail. We're gonna show you that there. So I'm underexposed by a stop in two thirds here, protecting the highlights, and I'm just gonna be able to bring those shadows up. I'm at my base ISO of 200. And again, this is one of the benefits of this new technology that we're dealing with now. You basically don't have to worry about your shadow detail. Expose for the highlights, bring it up afterwards. You'll get the same amount of noise. So that lovely animal behind us there, you know, Richard Butler and Barney Britton and Gordon Lang and Kai Wong would call those zebras. And Dan Bercalia and Kerry Rose and Tony and Chelsea Northrup would call those zebras. So I guess Jordan and I, what are we gonna call them? Uh, zebras. Z z Zibras? No, that's another Zibres. country. We're going with zebras. Okay. Zibres. Now, when it comes to image quality, we're going to go quick on this one. I mean, the fact is the X-H1 has the same sensor as the X-T2, the X-T20, the X-C3. I mean, this is a known commodity. It's an excellent APS-C 24 megapixel sensor. If you check out DP Review sample photos, you can see a lot of good examples. As well, you'll notice, you know, maybe some slight differences. It handles flare a little bit better than the older cameras, but overall, it's very similar. I should mention this too. You know, Fuji really is going with a goal of providing providing with awesome JPEGs. Really rich color, nice skin tones. The new Eterno profile, I think, is mostly gonna jazz videographers. I don't know if photographers will find much use for it, but as you look at some of the samples here, you can see, you know, you can customize the camera and get the color and stuff looking the way you want. Or throw it into the RAW file. I'm gonna be using Capture One to process these and, you know, do what you wanna do with the files. Hey everyone, it's Jordan. So we get to talk about video now. Now Chris is actually shooting me on the X-H1 here and he's shooting it handheld. The stabilizer is one of the big things that was holding Fuji back from being really well considered for video. But right off the top, I wanna say, I think this has been a mismarketed camera. I'm seeing so much out there about how it compares to a GH5, to an A7S2. Really, this is a great hybrid camera. I would liken it more to like an A7R2 or a Panasonic G9. Can do really nice double duty, but I don't consider it primarily a video camera. Now that doesn't mean the specs are bad. I mean, we've got 4K 24 that Chris is shooting right now. We can do 17 by nine with it. Now it is still eight bit, but remember, if you're looking at hybrid cameras that shoot 10 bit, it's a GH5 and a GH5S at this point. So I mentioned that Chris is shooting me on F-Log right now, which is recorded internally, which is great, but we've now seen that move over to the X-T2, so that doesn't make that quite as special. However, this still has the Eterna profile, which is my favorite straight out of camera image. You can see some samples right here, just nice low contrast. You can play with the files a bit if you want to, but I wouldn't bother. If I had to deliver a project next day, I would shoot it in the Eterna profile. Looks fantastic straight out of camera. Now the other nice thing with this is we do have 120p at 1080, 
Now, it's not the sharpest quality out there, and again, the X-T2 just received the same functionality. That's the awesome thing about Fuji, but if you're buying this camera for video capability, it means we might see some of these same things trickle into some of the rest of the line. Now we're shooting at 200 megabits per second in 4K right now, and you can see even with all this motion going on, this is really difficult for a video file, but it's holding together wonderfully, unless YouTube compression is totally screwing it up for us right now. So while Chris is shooting us on the Eterna profile, you can see very nice, you don't really have to play with those files at all. But as well, my favorite thing about this camera is the viewfinder on it. We got the 3.69 million dot EVF from the GH5, but it's very sharp, 0.75 magnification. I can easily pull focus without having to punch in and check my focus. Other things that are kind of annoying is we do have to use the battery grip if we want to use headphones and actually monitor our audio, but we do have the new touch silent interface for video recording. So you don't have to make any sound. All operates from the touch screen and it keeps your settings all separate from stills mode. It's a great idea, but I do find it's a little cumbersome, a little bit laggy with the touch screen on this. Most of the time I find I would just use the traditional dials and deal with the fact that it's a pain if I want to go back and shoot stills. If you're jumping back and forth, this could be really useful though. So I may not love the silent movie control, but one thing handling wise that's a huge deal is we have linear focusing with focus by wire lenses. This is enormous people. Now I've been complaining forever about focus by wire, it's very inconsistent. With the linear motor, if you do the same move twice, you will get the same results. Now it's not perfect, there's no hard stops on it. You can't look at your lens to see where you're actually focused. You have to look at the camera body, but it's a huge improvement. And I wanna see this on every single camera body tomorrow. This is a DP review video, very important. Everyone pay attention to it, put this in every camera tomorrow. Now going back to, again to things that bug me a little bit, when we're using this camera, we've got a 15 minute record limit when we're not using the grip. Now, we've never had this camera overheat, but it is a bit of a pain. You need the battery grip to get 30 minutes, and we've done long recordings, and it's still no overheating issues. I'm not sure exactly why we have this limitation, but it's a real pain. So let's say you want to do some of that run and gun shooting that all the kids are talking about right now. We're in autofocus mode right now. We've got the stabilizer on, walking handheld, and you can see it does a really good job at those two things. Problem is, there's no fully articulating screen with this thing, so I can't see if I'm in focus or the footage is that bouncy. As well, there's no exposure aids. We have no waveforms, but we don't even have zebras or zebras, as we've discussed earlier. So hitting exposure can be a real issue. Also, when we, I walked from inside to outside, you probably saw there, the exposure changes in big third stop chunky increments. Doesn't look very good. I wish that was smoothed out a little bit. So after using this camera extensively for months, my takeaway from it is that it's a very specialized beast, but it's very capable. If you need quick turnaround, the Eterna profile is almost worth the price of admission alone, and I love using the EVF, and the stabilizer is quite effective on this. But you could also grab an X-T2 now that it's got the internal F-Log, the 120 frame per second slow-mo, shoot that thing in F-Log, throw the Eterna LUT, which is now available, onto your footage after the fact, and you're getting something very similar to the X-H1. So this is a very good camera, but if it's worth the price point, I don't know, it's got some stiff competition out there for video. So much like that dinosaur back there, SLRs in the hands of wildlife users are about to become extinct. No, I'm just kidding, don't get mad. Leave your hate mail in the comments below. I'm kidding, sort of because you can really look at the Fuji X-H1 in three different ways, and they're all valid. I mean, the first way is this gives Fuji users a heavier body to balance their bigger long lenses when they want to do wildlife and sports and adventure photography. Absolutely. The other thing you look at it is this is an attempt to win over SLR users from their Nikons and Canons into a mirrorless body with an awesome EVF that still has a lot of the capabilities that they'd want, but the price point of the X-H1 kind of puts it right on par with a lot of those high-end SLRs, and I still think that some of them are going to focus better than this camera and shoot very rapidly. Third way is to look at this as strictly a new video camera from Fuji, but as much as you see on the internet, I really think that's missing half the point. Those features are improved, but this camera is definitely more than that. You know, on top of that, I think the X-H1 has some amazing features. I mean, you're getting the inbuilt stabilization, big bonus. I love the quiet mechanical shutter. It's just so silent and smooth, makes almost no noise, great for wildlife shooting. This is actually the first Fuji camera to feature electronic first curtain 
shutters, so that just only helps to make it quiet, and it works great. On top of that, I think the X-H1 is a very viable wildlife platform, but I can't help but feel that the autofocus features are still a little bit lagging behind, especially with that centralized phase detection autofocus. All in all, though, it's an interesting rugged body. Again, go to dpreview.com, check out all the facts on their full review. That'll give you a good heads up on the technology that's involved here. Hopefully you found this uh, review useful. Again, leave your comments below. Don't forget to check us out on Instagram. Subscribe to the channel, please. This brand new channel needs subscribers to help it grow, so we're counting on you out there. Let us know any comments on Twitter. We'll see you guys very soon.